Hello and welcome to Understanding Cyber with Toby and... And with me, Tom. Today, we also are joined by a guest, Dr. Andy Grayland, who is joining us as a CISO from Silobreaker. Andy has previously been a CISO for Scottish Local Government. This is his second full-time CISO job. And he also has a PhD in Computer Science and a PG Cert in Cyber Defence and Information Assurance. Hi, Andy. Hi, Toby and Tom. Um, I really like what you've been doing with this podcast, so thanks for having me. Thanks, Andy. It's really good to have you. I think Toby was saying this earlier on, and he's the second guest we've had in 33 episodes. So um, it's great to have a, a, a new sound. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it too. So thanks for coming along. Cool. Um, so why have we got Andy in as much as him being a magnificent chat? Um, what we want to talk about today is what a, what is a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer. And at ClearCut Cyber, we've done some work with CISOs and delivered some um, interim part-time CISO services. But Andy's full-time job is acting as that Chief Information and Security Service, uh, Chief Information and Security Officer. So between us, we think we've got a pretty good bases covered, and Andy should bring some really good experience to us. I'm going to kick things off and keep things really simple. Andy, what is a CISO? What, what, what do these people do? Well, um, a CISO is a senior level executive responsible for developing and implementing an InfoSec program to protect data and systems. A CISO's job is to balance the risks versus opportunities in information technology for a particular business or organization. In most organizations, a good CISO will be primarily focused on revenue and profit protection through the lens of cybersecurity. Exceptions to this might be the public sector or some charities where public perception is the key metric by which the organization is ultimately judged. But overall, it's that protection of data and systems. Awesome. Uh, Tom, you got anything to add to that? No, I think Andy, unsurprisingly, has, has nailed that. Um, I think there's some some interesting points to draw out there. And he talked about you know, being a senior level executive and he mentioned the kind of scope of responsibility there. And it's 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 considerable. It's um it's, it's sizable, no pun intended. But um one thing we've noticed is that uh, we're going to be careful how I phrase this. We've seen um, roles out there in industry and uh, in the corporate sector where they're described as uh, as a CISO and and they're kind of not because they don't have that level of seniority attached to the role or that level of responsibility or that, that sort of scope of responsibility. So I guess uh, from my experience, a little bit of a piece of advice, if you're looking at some of these roles or you're continue, considering advertising for these roles, do you really mean CISO? Does this role really look like a CISO or is this actually uh, a head of information security for a sub-department or something? But it's a, it's a serious job and it, it deserves a serious title. Cool. So the kind of agreement there, kind of like they are the senior person responsible for cybersecurity, generally going to be focused on protecting revenue and profit elements of the business in the commercial sector. Do we think then that CISOs are part of the C-suite, part of the board? Um, or do you reckon sometimes they're not? Is it, are they still a CISO if they haven't got a seat at that top level board? So I would say a CISO is a CISO if they own the responsibility to define the security strategy for the organization. A CISO must have presence on the board, but this doesn't need to be direct, provided they have a channel through which to address the board routinely, for example, through the CEO. The CISO should also be available and capable to present as a guest at the board where they don't have a permanency on it. Cool. So I suppose it kind of depends on that business organization and culture, but the CISO needs to be able to influence past stuff and they're the responsible, probably accountable person for cybersecurity. That's right, yeah. Um, it, the, the key thing is, is do they have the ability to get that ultimate message to the board and how they do that can differ within the organization. Yeah. And then we could also, like the other kind of technology role we might hear about is the chief technology officer or the chief information officer. Um, what's the kind of difference between them? Supposedly a CIO is there to do overall IT strategy, security vision. Do CISOs report to them and they're separate or does it depend? Um, I, I would say this isn't how it always works in practice, but I believe that a CISO should sit independent of the CIO or CTO. The primary driver for a CIO is opportunity. And the primary driver for a CISO is balancing opportunity with risk. A CISO who sits under a CIO is not a CISO, in my opinion. If you think of an organization as a pyramid with multiple layers, with the board at the top and the frontline workers at the bottom, at each managerial level, one of their roles is to decide upon the information flow to the next level up. And having a CISO to report to the CIO produces a potential conflict of interest where the senior leader wishes to an ex uh, so so where the, the senior leader wishes to exploit an opportunity and ignores the risks outlined by their CISO. I would recommend that such decisions should be 
impartially presented to the CEO and in some cases the board. And the only way to ensure that that happens is for the CISO to be independent of the CIO. Cool. Very succinct. Nice. Tom, anything to add? Or no, I like that. And as Andy said, I think that's a, that's a great description. There just needs to be adequate separation of responsibility between those two channels for the reasons described. They, they serve very different purposes and for the business to get the most out of them, they need to ma maintain that integrity between the two roles. Cool. So let's go back to like, from one of the first things we spoke about is like they might have a job in protecting profit or in like government CISO is going to have a different role. I take it there's kind of different types of CISO we might come across then and regional CISOs, top level ones. What do you, can you uh, explain a bit more about that? No, I, I wouldn't say there's different types of CISO. Using the definition of CISO we talked about earlier, which is a senior level executive responsible for developing and implementing an InfoSec program to protect data and systems, there is only one type of CISO. If you don't have that as your primary task, you're not a CISO. However, in different organizations, the specific roles the CISO needs to carry out in order to achieve that task can be wildly different. For example, in a small organization, the CISO may need to carry out technical tasks or audits themselves because they don't have enough staff to do anything else. Whereas in a very large company, they may lead the teams that carry out those tasks and never actually get involved with doing those tasks themselves. In some organizations, the CISO may have a large team working directly for them. In others, the CISO's generated tasks may be distributed via matrix management to individuals who do not work for the CISO at all. So it really depends on the culture of the company, how those CISO roles will work out. But ultimately, I could tell you whether someone is a CISO or not by using that initial definition that we talked about. And I think that stands in all cases. Nice. Uh, and Tom's making thumbs up, smiling noises at me. So I'll just carry on. Um, there's the idea then like that CISO could be an employee or they could be an interim or part-time thing. And that's something um, Tom's had some experience doing. Like, what do you think the difference is, Tom, like that kind of part-time role versus full-time? What's more different organizations? Why do they want a part-time CISO? Yeah, it's interesting. And, uh, and hearing Andy's answer there is quite reassuring because to go back one step, it's something we've kind of um, we, not struggled, but we have faced challenges in explaining to customers what the benefit of having a part-time or interim CISO is. And I know in, in the industry, there's a lot of kind of questions being raised about, you know, is this is it a real thing? Do people really need this? Or is it just people being opportunistic and making up a um, a, a service offering for them? But I think it is a useful thing, have it, having done it. As Andy said, fundamentally, it goes back to that, that initial definition and the, the roles that you're performing may be very different. But you know, if you're, as long as you're satisfying that high level function, then you're, um, you're, doing, you're doing the good stuff. So we, we've had experience of doing this, it, going into an organization Yes, you have to spend a lot of time getting up to speed and getting the right relationships and getting the right authorities to do stuff. But fundamentally, you can still carry out those tasks on a somewhat part-time basis, as long as you're paying enough attention to the, to, the, to the role itself, what it deserves, what the organization absolutely needs. It is difficult, though, because you're not there all the time. There are inherent limitations on that. And back to Andy's point about the types of roles that you can, you can fulfill. And you can't do everything as an interim or as a part-time CISO. Andy, I don't know if you've got experience of, of working with part-time CISOs or, or even being one yourself or your thoughts on them. Very keen to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I don't have any direct experience, um, but, but just looking at it from my point of view, if I was to go into a company, I need to spend the first three months understanding everything about that company in order to do my job properly, to get that right balance between risk and opportunity and not just shutting down every opportunity because there's a little bit of risk. And, and knowing where that balance lies and how to present that correctly to all of the personalities within the organization. I think that that's very difficult to do uh, in a short amount of time. So when you're scoping the amount of work that is required, you can't just consider writing policies, checking procedures, and getting a, a tick in the box ISO 27001 certification. You need to factor in all those other holistic um, tasks that you have to do to be successful. And sure, yeah, in small companies, you could do that one day a week. You could do that um, for a period of 12 months as an interim. You know, there's there's loads of different ways you could do that as long as you factor in that extra time you need. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you said, actually, because one of the people who did this for most recently was a, a very large charity. And for, for other reasons, we had worked with them for a very long time. And uh, we moved into, we did some, you know, like you said, policy, some incident response planning, that kind of stuff. And then we moved into the more interim CISO space. And it was after, I think, maybe six months of doing that on a you know, very part-time basis that I finally felt fully confident to do all of those things you just described because actually i did understand the organization i understood their risk appetite i understood their business functions um, and i was able to kind of really really think quite clearly like a like a proper CISO. Um, but that's not always not always possible at all if the time isn't there so yeah you're right we need to factor that in well cool. so we kind of mentioned a number of the like activities and how it depends what 
the CISO are going to be doing day to day? Do you think there's like a core set of skills then that CISOs need or have, or is it very company organization situation dependent? Yeah, there's definitely a core set. I mean, there will be company specific ones as well or sector specific ones, but in terms of core, my first most important skill for a CISO will be viewed as a little controversial in some circles. I think that a CISO must have a deep technical understanding in order to be good at their job. Some InfoSec practitioners view security audit as the be-all and end-all of information security. And, and, and I just can't see a way that you can balance risks against opportunities without knowing exactly how the technology works and how it's used. That doesn't mean you have to know everything, of course. No one does know everything. But you must have a level of understanding sufficient for a subject matter expert to be able to quickly and concisely explain a system of systems to you without each dis- discussion resorting to a lesson in first principles. Um, my second most important skill would be being able to clearly communicate with everyone in the business from the frontline worker right up to the CEO and the board. And, and the idea behind that is how are you going to learn the business and its processes without being able to talk to people? And the third is the ability to synthesize the roles and priorities of all of your peers into a coherent understanding of business inputs, business processes, and business outputs. The knowledge needed will vary drastically depending on the organization's sector and size. But for example, if the primary output of your business is B2B sales, you had best understand how the B2C, B2B sales process works and who does what when if you want to succeed in balancing risk against opportunity. Nice. That's really, good, really good points there. I think that, especially that, that first one, Andy, about how technical you need to be. There's, a, there's long-standing debates, quite heated debates, I think, in the InfoSec community around some people say, no, you don't need to be technical at all as long as you can think strategically and so on. I must say, I don't think I've always bought into that, although I don't count myself as hugely technical, certainly not technical as you. But I, I agree. I think you do need a good element for the reasons you described, a good element of technical understanding. Communication is pretty clear too. And I, I think that, the understanding of the business one is 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 probably one of the things that it took me the longest to appreciate. That I think Toby, you recommended the Phoenix Project to me, which is a great book. I recommend that to anybody. That's a really good example. Although it's kind of it's contrived, it's a really good example of the importance of understanding how an organisation functions at a really deep level, and then being able to to operate within that. Um, but the, no, these these are really a really great set of um, set of thoughts there. I need to write this down for my next job interview. Not that I'm going anywhere, Toby. <laughs> You're stuck. Um... <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> So that, that's really cool. Um, so let's dive into like a little bit of a case study then, and let's take Andy's current role at Spider Broker, um, which, for those that don't know, is a very capable, credible threat intelligence company, not just cyber, but general threat intelligence. Why does Silent Breaker need a CISO, and how do you fit into the wider organization? So my role at Silent Breaker is twofold. The first is to do all of the tasks that we've touched on earlier in this chat. Our security objectives include the um, ensuring that Silobreaker does not become a victim of an impactful cyber attack in order to ensure service availability for our customers, as well as to protect our brand reputation. And our brand reputation is quite important for us as a company in the cyber market. We're not going to be very credible if we ourselves are ha- uh, trying to sell in this space. Where my job differs somewhat to reg- a regular CISO is that Silobreaker is an open source threat intelligence company. And it makes sense for me to be involved in both the product development and discussions with our current and future customers about the best ways in which threat intelligence can help them to achieve their security objectives. The new ISO 27001-2022 standard has threat intelligence as a top-level control for the first time, 5.7. It also um, It's also in the NISD guidance from the NCSC. So this area continues to grow as a must-have for CISOs devising their InfoSex programs. Nice. Okay. Um, so that's really useful to understand why Silent Breaker has you as a CLA. You're like, what kind of roles? And we've spoken about the jobs in there. Like, how mature does a company need to be when it's deciding how it sees so, it? Like, two people, you're probably like, um, we could divide the security responsibilities. We don't need a full time CISO role. Or maybe you go, we're going to need to like, carve out 20% of my time to be thinking about CISO. Is it five people? Is it 10 people? Is it a revenue measure? Direct exposure? What are the kind of metrics that go like, ah, oh, we should be thinking about getting a CISO now. What do you think that tipping point is? Yeah, I don't think you can do it on the number of people. Like, So, for example, if you've got a farm in the UK and you employ 100 people, it's not likely that you're going to need a CISO. Whereas if you've got an office doing B2B sales in London and you've got 10 people, there is a chance you might need one. 
Um, I, I would say that a company needs a CISO when a large scale loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability of their information systems would result in a significant inability to achieve one or more of their strategic objectives. And what does that mean in practice? Any company with a formal board and a reliance on information system needs a CISO. There, there's probably no way around that. If you've got a board and you rely on IT, then you need a CISO. Now, that CISO needn't be full-time and could exist as a third-party resource in some cases. But in the planning for deciding to onboard a CISO, as I said previously, the organization will need to ensure that adequate time is given to understand the business and the people involved. Cool. Tom, do you agree? Do you like, like click us over? If we lost our IT, we'd be in a really big problem. We're only five of us who haven't thought about having it. So what are your thoughts? I think I should get another role as a CISO in the company as well, uh, an extra paycheck on, on the top. Oh, that's oh, good luck with that. Um, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> um, no, I think Ali's right. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's a continuum and there's no kind of flip of the switch moment where suddenly you go from one day not needing one to the next day needing one. It's, I guess it's a case of tracking your security needs as you, as you grow and mature as an organization, saying, right, in terms of the functions that need to happen, to, to, you know, to maintain our prosperity and the confidentiality, integrity, availability of our data. How, how big are those functions? How big is the responsibility? And does that entail having a full-time person or a half, you know, part-time person or something? Um, but it's tricky. You know, you, as I say, you can't just go from nothing to everything suddenly. It's a bit of a, I hate the cliche, but it's a bit of a journey. Um, and you've got to keep your eye on it. But that's why you know, services like some of the stuff we offer in terms of advisory and consultancy and, and um, interim uh, CISO stuff exists to kind of help people um, get, get themselves up to, up to speed with, with that function. I I say, sorry to interrupt, Toby, but I, just to what Tom said there, I, I think another level that we can definitively say is if you don't have an organizational risk register for non-cyber risks, then you don't need a CISO because there are much bigger risks out there to your company that are not in the form of cybersecurity. So there's a good starting point. If you don't have a whole organization uh, risk register, then you don't need a CISO. You need to be looking at your other issues first. Yeah, clean house first. Yeah, and then, and then what about CISO role? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think my view is you're going to have like secure, like start thinking about security things. And whether it's one person does ten minutes a week, like that function is going to blossom and bloom when it takes up more than a period of time for an employee. Like it becomes like fifty percent of their time just staying on top of security things. There's probably a bunch of things you're missing, and you should create a security function properly in there to do it. Yeah. Um, Cool. Oh, so like we, we discussed like skills and sizes. Um, let's say either one of you are going into a brand new company and they've not had a CISO before. And congratulations, you're going in um, completely clean starting point. What do you think the first actions of a CISO should be? We've kind of mentioned a little bit about understanding what's going on, but is this understanding the first thing or is it um, just going in and getting deep into the technical and viewing firewall logs? What are the first actions you'd expect CISOs to be doing? No, I, I think it will come as no surprise to you, given what I've said through the previous um, 20 minutes, that understanding is the first thing on my list. It, it's down as understand, understand the people, understand the product, understand the processes, and understand the market. So, and, and depending on the sector, there might be other areas to understand there as well. And that's the first thing. I, I don't see how anyone can do any form of, of even um, security consultation without understanding those things. Then um, this one may be a bit controversial too, but I would recommend some kind of rapid threat modeling. And this isn't, you know, working out using um, a standardized threat modeling technique, all of the areas that your company might be vulnerable. But um, it might take you a year to get to the stage where you have a really fully functional InfoSec program. And you need to work out straight away if there are any glaring holes in your security that need to be fixed today. Yeah. Um, Using a standard like Cyber Essentials might be good for this. Um, now, I don't mean to achieve the certification for most companies, big companies. Cyber Essentials is not an appropriate certification. You, you might not even be able to achieve it. But what I mean is using the actual framework itself um, So for your rapid threat modeling. So look at your firewalls, look at your secure configuration, look at patch management, look at user control, and look at malware protection. Those five areas, if they are not right, there's almost no point in going on to a fully-fledged information security program. So get those areas right as soon as possible. Um, third thing then is having worked out what's wrong, implement those immediate mitigations. And then finally, the fourth thing is commence the design of that InfoSec program, which is going to be your bread and butter as the CISO. 
Yeah, and I love like the roller coaster analogy. Are you tall enough to go on this ride? There's no point like spending ages going, oh, I'm going to design this next pane of glass, see multi machine, when you're actually three foot tall and not tall enough to that because you haven't done the basics first. You've got to grow, be able to do all the basics well before you can ride the ride of the exciting things. Personally, I, I love that do some quick, dirty threat modeling. If someone ha- lets me know a whiteboard and a pen, there's going to be an attack tree up there of the basic stuff that you could do and things to check up there before Tom's had a chance to stop me. Um, and he's smiling, laughing, because he knows it's absolutely true that I'm a danger of a whiteboard. Um, Tom agreed? <laughs> absolutely agreed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with a, with a little set marker. Um, cool. Um, so, like, last kind of question and thought today on CISOs is I'm... Intersec, been working in Infosec, let's say I've been obviously for more than two years. Let's say I've just been two years, been working a basic kind of IT or security job, and I aspire one day to be a CISO. Like, what's the route to that? Is it training? Is it experience? We hear about courses like CISP and CISM. Is that the answer? How do I go about what does that training pathway look like? So, I'd recommend the, the basis, the absolute basis of being a CISO, going back to one of the original questions, is some kind of technical skill, whatever that might be. Um, ideally, that would be in some way connected to the role of your company in the market. So, for example, if you were the CISO of a data center, you might want to get CCNA. If you're the CISO of a SaaS company, you might want to do Azure security qualifications. But ultimately, just to get that level of technical understanding so that when something new pops up and one of your experts talk to you about it, you're not sitting there Googling every single word because you don't understand what they're talking about. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, CISP and, and CISM, um, they are both overrated and underrated in different regards. Um, CISP is a very, very good baseline to say that you have a decent set of knowledge. However, it is relatively easy for someone who is quite good at ingesting information to pass that exam. Um, the five years of experience should block those people out from being in, immediately able to say they got CISP. However, that's all done on trust, and the trust system doesn't really work that well. So, um, you, but you do need so that. But that means saying um, why you shouldn't get CISP because it might not be worth very much. But on the other hand, um, if you're in the job market and you don't have CISM or CISP, and you don't put them on your application form that it's highly unlikely you're not you're going to get to an interview stage with a company of any size because they will have immediately weeded you out as not having those qualifications so sure get something like that but once you've got it you then need to do the real work um but my biggest recommendation for a CISO is an unusual one um i would be recommending getting something kind some kind of business related qualification for me, I covered MBA modules in a postgraduate university setting. Um, CISOs need to remember that the primary output of security is to keep the business making money or public trust in the case of the public sector. Whilst that's achieved by stopping attacks, it's also achieved by not cutting off people's ability to do their jobs efficiently. And the only way you can do that is by understanding the business. Nice. Tom, anything to add? Or are you pretty happy? Yeah, no, I think Andy's, Andy's really covered very nicely um cisp and cisp and so on i think i totally agree they have their place um you can be you know uh, we'll see caesars out there who don't have those because actually they're very good and they've been there for doing that kind of stuff for a long time but equally in the job market if you don't have it people are going to ask questions i think one of the, one of the things that i was encouraged to to go out and do when i was doing my because i started in information security from nothing i was flying helicopters and then, then transferred to kind of chain career um, so I chose to do a master's, not necessary for everybody, absolutely not. I felt that was the right route for me. But they said, look, if you're going to do this and do this properly and professionally, one thing you should be doing and should find yourself doing is um, is online research, open source research, and listening to podcasts, reading articles, taking a general interest and curiosity, because that kind of knowledge will stand you in really good stead when you go into this professionally. And also the fact that you are doing that, and this is why things like CPDs exist in the first place, the fact that you're doing that shows that you care and that you feel a, you know, an integrated part of this profession and you take this seriously. So. I really encourage people to almost to test your will, but also improve your knowledge by reading articles, going on, register, motherboard, wired, whatever, um, uh, listening to other podcasts, this one included. Um, Brisky Biz is great, right? And, and loads more too, just like Toby. There's thousands of them. Immerse yourself in what it means to be in this profession, and you will soon find that you learn loads, and also you, you are demonstrating credibility to, to yourself and to others as well. Nice. Anything else to add, Andy, before I do a little summary? No, I think we've covered everything. That's it. Anyone who's listened to this podcast can now come and take my job. Perfect. Done. Easy.
so I'm going to summarize or try and summarize that kind of wide ranging and really interesting conversation we just had. So the first thing was what is a CISO? And Andy gave us a nice definition there that the CISO is responsible for establishing, maintaining um, cybersecurity strategy and being able to report directly to the board. Um, and they need to be able to do that in that kind of independent way, separate from the CIO or CTO function. They need to have that channel of communication. We thought they didn't need to be a board member, but they needed that um, ability to do it. We discussed, do CISOs have different roles or like different types of CISOs? And actually, while the activities a CISO might do, as long as they're meeting that top level function of trying to protect that organization's ability to generate re um, revenue or their um, kind of reputation in the public sector, then the, that is going to be the only type. And while that job function might be taken by someone full time, it might be a senior um, and then a number of deputy CISOs, or it might be someone doing it part time, that function's always going to be the same. Discuss what kind of skills CISOs need, and Andy gave us a really clear answer of three things. Of They must be technically competent and able to translate to that technical thing. They must be able to talk and communicate to anyone in the business. And thirdly, they must be able to understand the business. From there, we discussed when CISOs are needed. Is it kind of a, you're this tool to ride the roller coaster? Congratulations, you now need a CISO. Um, but we can come to a firm metric, but it's all going to depend on if your organization is so reliant on information and computer systems, you'd start to lose revenue, whether it's confidentiality, integrity, availability, then you probably need a CISO and it's getting that bad. And they gave a good ready metric of if you don't have a general organization risk register, you probably don't need a cyber one to sort the main things out first. From there, get kind of some top tips on what the first actions of a CISO would be. And Andy spoke about understand, 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 understand the people, understand the business, understand the processes, understand the market. After that understanding, some rapid threat modeling um, to work out what the closest crocodiles are to your canoe. You can also think about um, some of the things that Tom and I spoke in our previous episode of what's important, where we spoke about understand the business functions, the abilities that support it, and then the technology and the risk there. Finally, we spoke about what kind of training um, and courses CISO should do, and Andy and Tom both spoke about get that technical baseline, then the security things, and make sure you don't neglect the business. So MBA modules, all the stuff like that are really, really important in there. I think that pretty much anything. Um, what I'll do is ask Andy, um, like, free chance to chat about Silo Breaker. What do they do? Um, what do people need to know about Silo Breaker? Sure. So I won't bore you with too many details about Silo Breaker in this format, but if you're in the process of setting up or improving your security management system and you're working on threat intelligence or third party risk management, we can offer you a world beating tool to make your life a whole lot easier and your company a whole lot safer. So if you'd like to have a chat about your needs, uh, you can contact me at andy.grayland at silobreaker.com, and I'm happy to chat with anyone. Perfect. Thank you very much. And having seen the tool um, previously, it is absolutely phenomenal, the amount of stuff it can pull in. It's jaw-dropping. It's absolutely amazing. Cool. And if you want help um, designing a CISO job or someone doing the initial threat modeling or wanting an interim or part-time CISO or someone to help you with a security function, establish it for your business, get in contact with myself and Tom at ClearCut Cyber. That is best done from the info at clearcutcyber.com email address or just go to our website. Um, that's it for me, Toby. Um, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. Um, chaps, over to you to say goodbye. Thanks so much indeed, Andy. Great to have you along. Uh, we'll catch you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me both. Um, it's been great chatting to you both. Thank you much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.